Hi everybody, I thought I'd do a book review today because um, I haven't done one for a while and I've just finished this pretty impressive book uh, and it's called Cherry and it's the life of Apsley Cherry Garrard who went with Captain Scott to the um, South Pole um, second youngest on his team and came back and lived a life basically uh, following that time um, the greatest time of his life according to the book was down in the South Pole um, just my background here I thought I'd do it in my Scott room uh, as you can see behind me they're all there at the pole listening to me waxing lyrical about Cherry this book what can I tell you first of all? Well, it was published in 2001 by Sarah Wheeler, who is also the author of Terra Incognita, and she's a bit of an ex well, she's a big explorer herself um, in the polar areas. Um, and no better person to write the story of Cherry. And a very, very interesting book it is. Now, it's divided really into two, well, a number of parts, but two main ones. Um, his adventures down at, the, at Antarct in Antarctica um, and his life subsequent to that. And before we get into that too much, um, I must tell you that there's, you know, I like a photo and there's a lot of nice photos in here. Most you will have seen, uh, maybe one or two you wouldn't have seen. Um, but, you know, it does give... I like a photo in a book, especially, um, you know, the books that I collect are generally around Antarctica and the South Pole and that expedition. Um, so I do like photos within them. Um, what else can I tell you about some paperback? It cost me a couple of quid on eBay. You know, if you want a good read, um, you can pick this stuff up. And, you know, I've collected a lot on eBay. Um... And it soon mounts up, you know. Um, and it's been described, the book has been described by the Daily Telegraph as magnificent and uh, by the Guardian as superb and accomplishes what can only the best, sorry, accomplishes what only the best biographies can, so says the Times. And at the front it has a photograph of the great man himself, Cherry, and he was a great man actually. Now, I was expecting... Um, a sort of tragedy uh, as a story and there is tragic aspects to this and um, I mean I'm no psychiatrist or anything but those who two things first of all those who went to the South Pole um, you know as part of that team or other teams uh, around Antarctica those who have gone to these Places where there was no, there was nothing. No bird flew, nothing grew, uh, no sound, constant sound, uh, not a breath of wind, biting wind. You know, uh, uh, some great extremes going on here. Um, uh, found they've a lot, uh, many found it difficult to readapt back into the real world, so to speak. And um, I was expecting Sherry to. Mm, maybe be a victim of that and there's another thing as well when you have been somewhere like that and class that as your great moment at a very young age how can you you know what then does life offer what is the goal after um you know, what is your purpose in life after? And he had, in some case, cases, a good start in life. In other cases, a poor start in life. For example, he would never, ever have had to work in his life. He bought his passage there, um, not just through money, but for his support of the project. Uh, he sent, you know, a lot of money to Scott um, to support the project. And he was invited to go along on the back of that so it wasn't a case of buying his way 
but his support brought his way into the trip. Um, and uh, because he had never had to work in his life, you then wonder, well, you know, what comes after? What can compare to the tragedy of the pole? The two years down there, the responsibility as a young man. Um, and that, that doesn't even involve his own majestic enterprise with Wilson and with Birdie Bowers to find the emperor penguin eggs and bring them back. Um, and of course, subsequent to that, you know, he, he, he is worthy of note for a different reason. Anyway, um, you know, so a good start in life in as much that he's never had to work, but a bad start in life, how do you fill your time up if you don't go to work? Um, and he would do a lot of cruising and a lot of, um, you know, travelling, even into old age. Um, but of course, nothing like his adventures as a young man. What else can I tell can I tell you? Well it does trace a story of not just him but his family and his um his estate. It describes how he came into uh the estate in Hertfordshire and what subsequently happened to it. Um it also shows that he wasn't really able to cope um, following the end of the First World War when society changed, when um, land taxes started to really bite into uh, country estates as we knew it, and the whole of British society um, and the landed gentry went to the war basically. Uh, certainly their estates did, and that's why so many now are in sort of um, public hands, uh, because of the taxes they couldn't possibly afford to keep going. And he subsequently sold all, all his land which I thought, I was, you know, when I first, you know, read little bits and bobs about him and, and discovered that he died in a flat in London, I worried about him, you know, when I picked up the book, I didn't go to the back, um, you know, I, I, I read it through and I was worried um, that he would, you know, in his, um, in his bad times, make bad decisions around his finances uh, and whether... You would say that his sale of his lands is a is a bad move. Um, for him, it was the right move, um, and the sad thing of it, if anything, is that he. I can only look at it from my point of view that he he thought only of himself really, uh, and his own comfort, rather than those who would go on after him. However, he didn't have children and, um, you know, it, it says in the book, well, he didn't want to pass his own issues, his own mental health issues onto any children. Um, we can't, you know, I don't know if anyone can possibly say that at all. I mean, we just don't know. Um, but we know that he did suffer terrible ill health, uh, even as a middle-aged man and into old, into old age as well. Not just mental health, but physical health as well. Um, he married very late. Uh, his wife was 20 or 30 years younger than him. Um, so having said all that about his estates, you know, was he getting ripped off left, right and centre? He was very careful around money. He did have a very um, good estates manager and, put, and um, his investments and his portfolio was well looked after also. And also, uh, the, the strange thing is that he may have not have um, been as well known as some on the trip, particularly these five here who are very well known, because they perished. Um, he was well known in two other areas. First of all, his, um, his uh, book on Scott's adventure... Uh, the word um, also particularly on Scott's adventure it was on the worst journey in the in the world, which is it talks about Scott and it talks about his own quest for the Emperor Penguin eggs with Wilson and with Bowers. Um, it was described 
as uh, the greatest um, the greatest adventure story ever. Um, not just the story itself, which was incredible enough, but the the way it is written. It's it's um, you know the language he use he uses. Uh, I've got the book in paperback only, uh, but uh, it's uh, the, you know the English literature of it second to none, and is therefore the greatest to uh, tourist book, if you will. It's been described as a tourist book um, ever, even to this day. Um, the second thing is that because he wrote because of the book maybe because he he was a he, he wrote. He would always write um, the bits or say a few words about, you know, the other explorers who were down there with him who died, subsequently, into, you know, into middle age, old age. He would always give, you know, uh, do, do the uh, um, the obituary for them. He, he was called upon to. He took it upon himself, but he was called upon to do that. So he had a great interest in, in writing, and he also had a great interest in books. And um, he collected books. And uh, one of his uh, one of his earliest books was uh, uh, by Dante from the fourteen hundreds. So he bought wisely. These books, you know, were priceless almost. Um, and yes, he did have um, uh, a flat in London, uh, and he sold other properties. Some in Swansea, some in Hertfordshire. Um, But he was, you know, he, he, he didn't lose everything. He retained, you know, his uh, wealth and, and also, um, you know, his reputation as a, as a fine collector of books and also as a writer himself. Okay, the one thing I was slightly disappointed in with the book, and it, it came to the end really, and I know this was written not with not with the permission of his widow, but with great help from the widow. But when Cherry dies, that stops. And I'm always interested in what happened to people after, you know, after they came back from the poll. What happened to those people? That's interesting. What you know, I'm interested in what happened to the widow after Cherry died. Well, she sh it doesn't say in here, but subsequently she did marry, probably within a year of Cherry's death. Now she was a lot younger than him. She may also have married his doctor, also known also known as his psychiatrist. Did she go on to have children? I believe not. She then became a great um, support supporter of um, polar exploration of uh, you know the society. You know all the people who were involved. She was a great. Um, supporter of you know the, the 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 people involved with his expedition or you know Scott's expedition and Shelley as part of that but also subsequent so she'd be involved with um, other polar explorers being there to help them um, and also being you know someone who you could co or people would contact for information about Shelley. Um, can I tell you anything else about the book? Well, it's a, it's difficult because he had a difficult life subsequent to it. It is fascinating the number of people this guy was involved with. George Bernard Shaw was a neighbour, um, T.E. Lawrence, uh, Lady Scott, Scott's widow, um, you know, he know he Cherry knew a lot of people, and it comes across. You know, there's lots of names in here uh, that you can subsequently look at and see. Well, good lord, he knew these people, um, but of course he wasn't. He was at one time one of the wealthiest people, one of the most eligible bachelors. He was almost like a um, a star when he came back from um, from Antarctica, and uh, he was very very jealous and very. Um, protective of uh, 
the party of the um, you know the Scots party and the, and the exhibition as a whole and anyone who would criticize it or not see it as he would see it he would challenge that um, what is interesting is that he eventually did fall out with Lady Scott <coughs> according to this book here uh, when Worst Journey in the World came out which by the way still sells really well today um, but she thought she was critical of it because he doubted Scott in some way within the book you know it wasn't like the gloss over that some people are saying happened with with uh, sub, you know with books on on the subject and Lady Scott then having read uh, Cherry's book went cool on him and she asked uh, a former MP called Stephen Gwynne um, to write according to her view of things um, to not challenge but to have a different slant on you know to oppose Cherry in some way um, I think they sort of retained cordial relations but Cherry was a hard man to He was a, he, he, it was difficult for him to mix freely and openly with people. Uh, he was a very isolated man. And um, um, so it's, you know, you, it's difficult to say whether they actually fell out or whether they ended on bad terms or good terms. Difficult to, to, to know that really. Um, but it, it, it points really to the whole ethos or the the whole slant of the book which uh, is uh, you have a very happy go lucky brave strong determined full of the joys of life um wonderful boy um but coming back from the antarctic and following the first world war in which he served uh, a completely different character all altogether and um the book really does. Uh, I think he would. I think he would like some of the book. I'm, I'm sure he'd be quite crotchety about other parts of it as well, and I'm sure he would like. To, and there's information in there that is not given. Um, you know, former girlfriends, an example. Um, so um, you know, a pri very private man. So to have written a book about about him, uh, which tells almost the whole story. Is quite an achievement by Sarah Wheeler. I do recommend it. It's a great read. It's easy to read. It's a page turner. I didn't want to put it down. I didn't want it to come to an end either. Um, there's a good, uh, there's a lot of notes at the back which you can really dig into and also a jolly good index and you know family mentioned in there and you know it's uh, if you if you're interested in the Antarctic and you're interested in um, you know those times as well and if you're just interested in autobiographies, this is great, or, or, or biographies, I should say. This is a great book. You need it in your collection. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I've rabbited on. 18 minutes, 38 seconds. Bye for now. Bye-bye.